Father, we thank you for the privilege of the new day. We thank you because your elect are hidden in the blood secured from the adverse winds of the end times. Father, and as the people of the world are intoxicated with the spirit of the age, we ask you to continually preserve your own. And we pray for it light always. That whenever we get on to you, you give us understanding of the times that were, the times that are, and the times to come. And let it please you, Father, to give us the enablement to comprehend the fullness of revelation concerning the human age that is coming to an end. We ask you to bless the Monday team led by Apostle Denise and Apostle Deborah and all those who pray. Have your way, Lord. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. We're grateful to our Father in heaven for the grace and enablement he has given to us to begin a study of this very difficult cause. Difficult, I will admit, because the truths in it are very inconvenient. They are politically incorrect. They are not things that should be said. They are things that people prefer that they are not spoken about, that they are, you know, just ignored. And that's the reason why things have remained stuck and many people remain stuck. And people don't forget that there are issues of heritage. They are all there in the Bible. Abraham is the, you know, we talk about the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's, a, he's an Elohim of genealogy. He's an Elohim of generations. And there are things in the Bible when you do not understand them, you just walk in ignorance. History will repeat itself. And people will remain run around in circles and there's no breakthrough. And people can even pray. People can fast and there's no breakthrough because the fundamental issues are not identified and, and dealt with. I pray that the Lord will enable all of us who are part of this cause to suspend our emotions and receive light from the word, and let the light propel us forward. As we said sometime last week, there are those who are so offended with the things of Genesis 9 that they tend to be angry enough, you know, to even create another gospel. Another gospel is being created now in which the basic thesis of the Bible is taken away. Black liberation theology. And it's based on the concept that, well, the gospel is a white man's religion, the gospel is a, 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 the Bible is white man's Bible, so let's recreate our own. Let's create a black Jesus, let's create black this, black that, black that. You know, that approach is not helpful. That is why many people from the Hamite community are being recruited into other religions in prison. Because of the way things are distorted, they, there's no doubt whatsoever that the sons of Japhet, in executing their mantle, they went into savage lands in some cases, went into terrible lands and, and occupied people and destroyed all that. But you know what? That does not in any way negate the truth of the Holy Scriptures. It doesn't justify the actions. And we say to people, don't let bitterness and anger and offense of the past you cannot change to get the better part of you. If they do, you'll be in greater danger than the one you are angry with. So it's important that we take the report of scripture. And the report of scripture is better. And in scripture, Yeshua said twice, that the last shall be the first. The first shall be the last. What does it mean? Men and brethren, I want to say this to you. But one of the things we closed out last week with on Friday was that one of the familiar tricks of colonialism is to subdue the mind of the conquered people and then reprogram it to believe lies and half truths about the people. So people end up believing what the conqueror has told them. And one of the lies that has been fostered across Africa is that Africa is just a dark continent full of savage tribes and forests and all manner of things and even people hanging on the trees and jumping up and down on the trees and all that until white civilization came from Europe. The civilization came 
And then with the civilization came the gospel. Well, the gospel that went to Africa is a distorted, corrupted gospel, not the gospel of the kingdom. Let's get that straight away. You know, but the truth is that the distortion of Africa to give impression that it was dark, nothing cut off from Elohim totally until the people went from Europe to the gospel. It is not correct. It is not true. Men and brethren, there are things in the Bible that prove that Africa had been part of Elohim's program. The sons of Ham were not cast out. Men and brethren, let's remind us number one. Abraham, the one Elohim chose to carry the seed of the woman. That through him, Elohim chose a definite family to carry it. When Abraham received the mantle in Genesis chapter 12, something happened. We are told in Genesis chapter 12, verse 11, to the verse 10, there was famine in the land. And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. So from there, we see that famine came upon Canaan, the land that Elohim gave to Abraham. And what happened? Abraham journeyed south. Where to? Africa. London in Egypt. And it was in Egypt that he was preserved until he went back. So, take note of that. Abraham was preserved in Africa. Number two, when there's a man in the land, Isaac, his son, reached out to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gera. These were Hamitic people. He reached out to them. Number three, the entire house of Israel led by Jacob is Petrach, was preserved from hunger and destruction in Egypt, the prime land of Africa, the land of Ham. According to Psalm 106, it was in Ham's land that the whole of Israel was preserved from destruction. Men and brethren, number four, Moses, the great deliverer of the Jews, the lawgiver, the one through whom the old covenant came, where was he preserved? Africa. Where was he trained? Africa. Where did he receive his mandate to be the leader of the old covenant? Africa. Men and brethren, number five, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses and Africa. And it was he who gave the great principles with which Moses was able to lead Israel in Exodus 18. From 1 to 27, he came and saw his son-in-law from morning till night, judging Israel. He said, Moses, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm judging the people. They bring, they have any matter, they bring it to me, and I'm the one that intercedes between them. I know him. He looked at his son-in-law. He didn't want his own daughter to be a widow prematurely. He said, listen, listen to me, Moses. Let me give you some wisdom. And go and pray and confirm with Elohim. You be the one who stands as the apostle over the whole nation. Be there to take their national causes to Elohim and bring his word to the people. But then look for people. Those who can rule thousands. Those who can rule uh, hundreds. Those who can rule fifties. Those who can rule tens. Set them over the people. He was, the wisdom Jethro gave to Moses still today in business schools across the world is still relevant. It came from him, an African. Men and brethren, Moses, of course, married an African. You know, Zipporah. And men and brethren, number six. When Yeshua was born, as we've said before, it was where was he preserved when Herod wanted to destroy him? It was already prophesied out of Africa, out of Egypt. Have I called my son? So he was preserved in Africa. Yeshua himself was preserved in Africa when they sought to kill him right at the onset of his life. Number seven, when he was on the way to Golgotha to go and pay the price for all humanity, to go and shed his blood that all humanity may be saved out of the house of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that singular event at the cross where he was to pay the price on the way to Golgotha, where were those who were close to him? Peter, away. Nathaniel, 
away, Philip, away. All of them nowhere to be found. It was an African. Simon of Cyrene, who was recruited to help him to carry the cross. So the act of helping him to carry that cross on which humanity's sins will be atoned it was an African that helped him. Number eight, men and brethren. Of course, you see that in March 27, 32. Men and brethren, people from Africa were present on the door of Pentecost when Holy Spirit empowered and activated the church. Even those, even though some of them had Jewish blood in them, but they came from Africa. And they didn't all dwell back in Africa. They went back to their places. Number nine, the Ethiopian eunuch was supernaturally saved and became a missionary to his home country in the very first few years of the church. The Alpha Age in Acts chapter 8, you know, from verse 26 to 40, the Ethiopian eunuch was converted at that early part. Men and brethren, number 10, the early church spread to North Africa. The early church spread to North Africa. There were flourishing Christian com communities along the Mediterranean coast. Alexandra, Carthage, those cities, Cyrene, they had Christian communities. Number 11, there were many among the church fathers of the first two centuries of the church, I mean, after the apostolic age, when Peter and Paul were executed in Rome, the land of Japheth, Peter crucified upside down, Paul beheaded. Do you know after that generation, the next set of people who emerged as leaders in the church, before some of them had issues with their theology, the first set of people, apologists of the faith, people who stood for the faith, were people like where most of them were of African descent. These included the man called Tertullian of Carthage, Tunisia. Between AD 160 to 225 AD, Tertullian was a powerful apologist of the first century, of that century church. What of origin of Egypt? between 185 to 254. What of Athanasius of Alexandra? Athanasius was the man who beautified the, the, the issue of the triuneness of Elohim. It was Athanasius that propounded it. It was Athanasius that took on another son of Ham called Arius, who developed the Arian controversy. It was Athanasius who developed the theology about the triuneness of Elohim, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that became the basis of the tree, Trinity today. He was born, he was a citizen of Alexandria, Egypt, from uh, 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 296 to 373. Then one of the most outstanding of the early church fathers was Augustine of Hippo, from 354 to 430. These were the people that truly, their writings, their writings were powerful in that century. So anybody telling you that Africa was just one dark continent and filled with ignorant people that didn't know anything until just two, three hundred years ago when Europeans came with the gospel, the gospel of Christian religion, the gospel of denomination and denominationalism, the gospel of division, the gospel of conquest, the gospel that carried the Bible in one hand and a sword in the other hand, where the Bible lured the people to sleep, where the sword take over their assets, take over their mineral resources and all that. There was a gospel that had come to Africa in the early years, men and brethren. So if you look at these things we mentioned, these 11 things, it tells us something about the redemptive purpose of Africa and the redemptive gifts there. Things that we need to know because we need to know them. Elohim had ordained in his own time that he would bring restoration. He will restore years that the locust age. And so if you have, you know, your, your ancestry to Africa, I want you to know it was not all dark and dang and all misery and pain. There were great things that the Father had in mind. 
If you look at those 11 things I just mentioned now, I want to say to you, men and brethren, some of these things the Father began to give in 1996 when he said, get out of denomination. Get out of denominational Christianity. It's a dead end. I didn't create you. I didn't redeem you to go and foster denominations and divisions. I, first, I, I redeemed you and I've called you for an assignment along with other remnants that is going to you literally fulfill my work that had been suspended for a lot of years. So what I'm sharing with you are things he spoke to this vessel. If it doesn't resonate in your heart, please don't take, take your stones and trap me. You, you want to get, stay in denominational Christianity. You want to stay in the corrupted gospel. Stay there. That's okay. You, between you and Elohim. But I'm sharing what he shared with us. Why he led us out. Why we do what we do. is because of these revelations that literally transform perspectives. Open eyes that cause the tears to stop. That caused the joy of the Lord to fill this heart. So what are the redemptive purposes of Africa? Number one, I want you to take note and then compare it what, of the, what you see today. You see that what you see today is a corrupting. Some of the things even happening in Africa today is not the gospel. It's not the assignment of Africa. Let's see the redemptive purpose of Africa if you want to check it vis-a-vis -vis what the Lord has just told us this morning. Number one, to act as a place of refuge for kingdom purpose of Elohim in the earth realm. What do we mean? The idea is this. Whether we are talking about the preservation of Yeshua in Africa or Abraham in, 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 in Africa, the key thing to take note of this, whenever the program of Elohim in the earth realm is in danger of destruction, is to Africa that the Father looks for preservation of what matters to him. That is awesome. This revelation literally blew this mind apart. This revelation literally set this heart on fire that there is a purpose of Elohim for Africa. It's not all the distorted things of history we read that Elohim looks to Africa to preserve what is corrupt? And listen to this. The corrupted gospel, the Father is looking to Africa to bring forth. We're going to, well, let's take it systematically. Number two, to provide the strategic assistance needful to ensure that the core purpose of Elohim is fulfilled. And this is illustrated with the assistant Simon of Cyrene, rendered to Yeshua, help him to carry the cross. In other words, it was indicative of something the Father was saying in the Spirit. Men and brethren, this is, you know, we need to know that there are things Elohim does to signify something. And if you are very much alert in the spirit, you will know that these things, when you take them seriously, you'll be spared a lot of things about the end of the age. You get to know about the significance of things. For instance, those of you in America, I know you are worrying, you know, what's happening, the polity, all that. Can I tell you, there's a prophetic fulfillment the animosity between liberals and uh, conservatives, Republicans and Democrats, all that you are seeing today, the confusion, the fear, the worry, the anxiety. How do you understand it? Is it by the lens of conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats? If you do so, you slide off path. How do you recognize it? You go back to scripture. What does Daniel say? Daniel said in the last days, an empire will arise in the earth rim. That will not be like other empires, but it will be divided within. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. And so there will be a lot of confusion. Yet it will be the prevailing power in the whole earth realm. It's in the days of that empire that the Elohim of heaven will set up the kingdom that cannot be moved. In other words, when you see this empire where there's the feet of clay and iron intermingled and not coherent, you know that we are in the end of the age. That is how you understand prophecy, through the Bible. Not through what people are telling you today. So, Africa... To be a place of refuge for the kingdom purpose of Elohim when it's in danger of destruction or corruption. Two, to provide strategic assistance, you know, needed to ensure that the core purpose of Elohim is fulfilled. Three, embrace of Yeshua. While, you know, acute poverty has decimated the black community, whether Africa or the diaspora, but you know what? Out of that poverty, 
It has created an enabling environment for people to be open for the message of hope that the gospel offers. Hope for esteem, hope for recovery, hope for everything. There are things you take for granted in Europe. Electricity, take for granted telephone, take for granted many things. In many places in Africa, every single thing has to be by faith. So the gospel becomes a very potent, it has, it finds an enabling environment for belief. So whereas in the land of Shem, a lot of people have caught up the gospel, in the land of Japheth, a lot of people have caught up the gospel, except a small remnant. In Africa, there is still a large reservoir of people who by what they have gone through are open to the gospel. That is wonderful. In other words, what the enemy meant for evil has now turned out for good. So people are open to the gospel because of the things that have happened. Yeshua is being embraced till today. Is it hope of the people till today? People know they need him for everything. They need him to live. Otherwise, which doctors will cut their life down? They need him to survive these sicknesses that come when there's no medical facility around. They will have to travel 30, 40, 50 miles for the, first, the nearest medical facility. So they need divine intervention. So the people are able to exercise faith and raw faith in him. That's why when you go to you know, places, you know, some of the crusades, the Raham Boke, the same Raham Boke can do a program in London. Nothing happens. Just a handful of people with miracles. You can go do in America, nothing happens. Let him go to Africa. And you see blind eyes open. You see people because of the environment, men and brethren. Number four, Africa is to bring clarity to the teaching and practice of prayer and spiritual warfare. Again, because of the environment, people know they have to survive. Every single thing about their life is by prayer, by spiritual warfare, by faith. So they that which the enemy meant for ill, to crush, to destroy, the Father is used to draw the people to himself. And people are blazing hot in prayer, in warfare. Things are happening in the name of Yeshua. Things are happening. Real raw miracles are still happening. Even in the villages, not big meetings, not big names. Your non prophet people are still giving accurate prophetic. No name, no title, no stage. Right there in localities, people are receiving light from Elohim. Number five, offsprings of Ham. We also ordained that which Noah was talking about. What he didn't know is that unconsciously, the typical son of Ham in the natural operates in great strength with the ability to do what many dare not touch. And let me say this to you. It is almost impossible for a Semitic person or a, or a Japhetite to survive the Middle Passage. That many people survive. I know a lot of people died and were thrown into the sea. Pack people like this, you know, the, the head of this one goes right there and the head of this one goes right there. People were packed like sardines. People defecated and it, it had to even touch other people. The order, the stench, all that. And yet at the end of it, survive and be strong enough. So land America, land the Caribbean on a Monday, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, they are deployed in a farm. You know what? Strange came into ruggedness. Go to some cities like Lagos, Nigeria, like Nairobi, Kenya, like Accra, Ghana. You see people from a, a up country, they'll come into a place and seven of them will live in a room. Each one will just take a little mat. They live in the room and they'll be doing their business and trading. And each of the seven, in the matter of one year, two years, is building a mansion back home. He's training three people in the university, but they are living rugged life. When he says endure hardness as a good soldier of Yeshua, that hardness is in the hermetic bloodstream. So what was meant for evil has become good. Men and brethren, number, um, number six, Yeshua sanctified service. The very thing Noah pronounced as a cause, serving your brothers, Shem, serving your brother, Japheth, in the days of Yeshua, the king of kings, the one whose words sums it all up. What Yeshua, what Noah called a cause, servanthood and service, 
Yeshua in Matthew chapter 20, 20 to 28, pronounced it as the key to leadership. In other words, if you are going to be a leader, go and serve. And Yeshua demonstrated in John 13, from 1 to 17, after they had died, he took away his garment and put a towel around him and began to wash the feet of the saints. And Peter said, you wash me. He said, if I don't wash you, you're not none of mine. He said, wash everything. He said, no. I said, what I have done, do it. So the typical one, redeemed out of the house of Shem, I mean, out of the house of Ham, has the grace of service. It's not affected by, forget about this one, you see these television uh, people you see. I'm talking about the real ones who are not yet plastic. They've not learned the ways of Japheth. You know what? They serve till today. They serve. So you see a pastor goes to church before the people he goes there 30 minutes, 4, 45 minutes there, one hour there, he goes, he prays. After prayer, he begins to arrange the chairs. He won't say, well, Osha hasn't come. He begins to arrange the chairs. He begins to even wipe things. Why? Service is wired. Serving other people is wired in the Hamitic people. So what was evil in the days of Noah is now like gold. If you have it, there's nowhere you cannot go. You have it, there's nowhere the Father will not use you. And the new covenant is superior to the old. And the word of Yeshua is superior to the word of Noah. And then number eight, I mean number seven, at the cross of Calvary, at the cross of Calvary, Yeshua canceled the curse of Noah. He canceled what Noah pronounced upon Ham and which had walked all along Yeshua pronounced it is finished. And if you read the entirety of the gospel, it's about, it's about breaking down the middle wall of partition as Paul had to articulate between the Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles being those from the house of Shem and the house of Japheth. And so Yeshua at the cross said it is finished and declared jubilee. And that jubilee is real. The reason why that jubilee has not been enjoyed by the house of Ham, the way it ought to be enjoyed, is because many African leaders are engaged in religion that was imported from Europe. And religion does not liberate. Religion keeps people in servitude and it serves that purpose. So you see religious leaders, they have a crowd of one million and all that. What are they teaching them? They are not teaching them the kingdom. They are teaching them religion. And so because of that, the things that seem to have happened from Noah's era are still subsisting to this day, even though the cross has happened. Number eight, the remnant of Elohim out of Ham are ordained to be instruments of provoking the Jews in the house of Shem to jealousy for their fate and to bring them back to Elohim. Um, listen to me, part of what this will do. The remnant of Ham will receive deeper understanding of the Torah, what, what the Torah was, what, is, what it was supposed to intend, and then deeper understanding of grace, they'll be able to recognize some of the more insidious aspects of replacement theology that was not recognized by others because this replacement theology was manufactured in Europe, the land of Japheth, and as a people who conquered others, they didn't want to believe, they didn't want to preach a gospel that had a lot of Jewishness. So the name of Elohim was, had to be taken away. The Elohim that was right there through from page one of the Bible, they had to call him by God, the generic God. The name of Yahweh was taken away. The name of Yeshua was taken away. First to the Japhetic word, Greek, Japhetic Greek word, Iosius. From there to the English word, the Anglicized Jesus. And all these things were part of replacement theology, really. You know, so the, out of the house of Ham, the father will raise a people who will not be ashamed to call Yahweh, Abba, Yahweh, by his name. The name he revealed himself to the earth rim. They won't be ashamed to call Yeshua by his name because they will chalk replacement theology out of the way and they will preach the gospel in such a profound way that when the typical Jew of the house of Shem hears someone redeemed from Shem, from Ham, preach the gospel, present it the way it was intended to be presented, something will chalk them and say, wow, wow, where is this coming from? 
Is this not our gospel? When they tell them, when they preach about Yeshua Hamashiach and present him by his name, present his assignment and how he fulfills all the prophecies that Moses and the prophets gave and talk about how Israel was scattered and how a prophecy is to be gathered together in one day when they give the Jews their history. The Jews will be provoked to jealousy. So what was written in Romans chapter 11 is going to happen when he talked about being blind in Israel so that the Gentiles will get it. It meant this season. And this will happen. This is going to happen. Number nine, the remnant out of Ham will be divinely taught the gospel of the kingdom. Elohim, by his spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, will teach the remnant out of the house of Shem, uh, uh, out of the house of uh, Ham, the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It was the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua gave his church to preach because that's what he preached. That's what John the Baptist preached. This gospel of the kingdom had been set aside, thrown aside, and in the land of Japheth, Christian religion came and has been exported worldwide. The plan of the Father is that he's going to go to the house of Ham, the neglected, the rejected, to rediscover the gospel of the kingdom and preach it worldwide. And all will be taught the truth. Number 10, in effect, the remnant out of Ham will be the instruments through which the remnant out of Shem, Ham, and Japheth will be recovered in the truth of the gospel. So that out of these three will come forth the one new man of Elohim that Paul spoke about in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians chapter 3. The one new man for which Paul was commissioned to go and break down the middle wall of partition. That process has not been continued. And the father will out of the house of Ham rediscover his remnant from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they will be the one new man. They will be the Omega Church. They will fulfill what we are told in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, 27. They will be without spot and wrinkle or other such thing. Because their revelation of the kingdom in them will be complete. The revelation of the Father will be complete. They will get to know the things and they will not be found in the ways of the world or the love of the world. They won't be found in things of Hollywood and Bollywood and Nollywood. They will be pure unto the Lord because their theology will be perfect as given by the Father, not distorted by men, not distorted by institutional Christianity. They will go back to the Bible and there you'll find real unity. Real unity is not everybody come to the same place and let's have a stadium church. Real unity is the unity of the Spirit. Real unity is the one where we grow up into him in all things, from the house of Shem, the house of Ham, the house of Japheth, the one new man, one identity in Yeshua. The colors of our skin will still remain because coat of many colors, Elohim has them. You go to Revelation 7, you see where it says the innumerable company that will out of all tribes and nations. But how will it come to pass? It's through the work the Lord will do with the house of Ham. That work which has been also distorted by Hamitic ministers operating in the order of Nimrod, who do not understand the gospel, but have re- tried to reconfigure it to build empires for themselves. They are corrupting the gospel. It was to be a short dispensation. The dispensation of Ham and the gospel was to be a very short one that would lead to the Omega Church, that would be the one that would close out all things. And the Father showed us one day in Acts chapter 3, verse 20, 21. Yeshua, we are told, Elohim, he will send Yeshua, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which Elohim has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And on waiting on the Lord, the Lord began to say some very profound things to us. And one of the things he said to us was that by his grace, he has ordained 
that before the end of the age comes, the Lord will give a go, as he has given to the house of Shem, to carry the baton of the gospel and run it until the day in Acts 28, 28, it was handed to the sons of Japheth and they ran it. The father's plan is that there will be a very short span of time when the remnant out of the house of Ham will be given the opportunity to be instruments of ex explaining the God, understanding the gospel of the kingdom, expounding the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel that transforms lives where people are subject to the king of kings. He is their sovereign ruler over their life. By his spirit, he determines everything about them. It's a gospel that changes an individual. From the individual, it changes the, the family. From the family, it changes the neighborhood. It changes the community. It impacts the, the city. It impacts the state. It impacts the nation. It changes the culture, the way of thinking of a people, the way of living of a people. It's a holistic gospel. You don't switch on and off it. It's a gospel where what you are in the day is what you are in the night. What you are in the house is what you are in the outside. What you are in your city is what you are in the mission field. It's a gospel that transforms people from inside out, renews their mind. And it's a gospel where people live as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, wherever they are. Whether they are in the fivefold, that's what they are. Whether they are called to the marketplace, you don't disturb them and say, come out of the marketplace and serve in the, in the pulpit. No, right there, the ambassadors of the kingdom, like Daniel was an ambassador of the kingdom, Joseph was an ambassador of the kingdom in the marketplace as civil society. The gospel of the kingdom is a holistic gospel. You cannot say, you okay, it touches every part, spirit, soul, and body. The same power that is able to redeem the spirit man is able to transform the soul, renew the mind, and cause glorious character to come forth. It's the same gospel that is able to bring healing and deliverance. It's able, the gospel is supposed to deliver from fears, deliver from inner healing issues, from inner healing issues that people carry. It's a holistic gospel. And this is why the Lord says, don't write Africa off. Don't write the diaspora of Africa in America, in Europe, off. There's a special assignment. And if you are one of that diaspora, if you are one of those in Africa, I want to say to you, you must reject Christian religion with everything in you. It's corrupt. It's limiting. It's not real. You must recover the gospel of the kingdom and preach it and teach it. The gospel that empowers, that creates value. The gospel that teaches people all so that they become disciples they move from believer to disciple and they move from disciple through, through through equipping they get to love the father and grow in him into all things they get to know themselves as friends of yeshua and sons of elohim take responsibility for his estate and through training and through equipping and activation and they are released to serve as priests after the order of melchizedek you cannot do this gospel while you cling to Levitical systems or Nimrodic systems. You cannot do it where you put yourself on a pedestal out there, untouchable, and you don't interact with the people. It's a gospel where you are hands-on with the people. You live with them. You show them example by the way you live, your priorities. You don't have priorities over other things. You make the main thing the main thing. It's a glorious opportunity. It's a glorious privilege. It's a short span of time and it's almost destroyed because poverty mentality is affecting a lot of people out of harm's lineage. And because of that, even in ministry, there's some people whose tendency is to look for their belly, to take care of themselves. We're going to talk about all these things. The reason why we talk a little bit about this because the father said it is the dispensation we are in. Sound the alarm. Let people come out of every diversion and distraction and focus on what the father has given as a glorious privilege so that the one new man of Elohim shall be inducted into his gospel program. What a wonderful privilege. What a wonderful opportunity. This is what dying for. This is what, you know, laying everything aside for. This is what paying the price for. This is what a, such a glorious privilege that the Father has given. And I want to say to you who are listening, even if you're of the house of Shem, pray it in. It's divine program. It has nothing to do with man. It's by election. Pray it in. 
because it will affect everybody for good. If you have the house of Japheth, don't get offended. Maybe you have some racism in your blood. You didn't even know it. These teachings will bring out that racist, racist trick. Repent of it. Be delivered of it. And embrace the truth of the Father. And thank the Father for it. Because eventually everybody will profit from it. Now, if the corrupted gospel, some Africans are running with it, will do, and creating big, big, big things like this. How much more if people understand the real gospel committed to Africa? The gospel that is producing people across. When I go to Zimbabwe and see what I see in Zimbabwe, what I see in Southern Africa, Zambia, South Africa, I know there is hope. I know there is hope. And I know that by the time from Southern Africa, the nozzle of the African gone, when they begin to walk in the fullness of that grace, the Father will use them to provoke West Africa to jealousy and East Africa to jealousy and cause them to also get back on track with the real assignment committed to Africa. Men and brethren, it's a glorious thing. And before we pray today, I want to remind you, one of uh, uh, leaders of IMF USA, you know, Apostle Geneva Young, her bad age today, we're going to pray for her on daybreak with the king. Men and brethren, distribute these things, not just this today, but I want to say to you, from Monday last week to today, if you will, and you are listening to the things we taught yesterday at Mission Central in London, take them, take them, go through, distribute them. And I have good news for you. Today, the editorial board led by Dr. Catherine Jones have released spiritual gifts. November 1, you know what? The beautiful work was released. And today, the beautiful work on ministry, discover, pursue, fulfill. Today, by the grace of Elohim, 5th November, spiritual gifts have been released. If you, if you understand the revelation in ministry, discover, pursue, fulfill, and understand the revelation in spiritual gifts, you'll be a better New Testament minister of the gospel. You'll be able to know what it requires to be in the gospel of the kingdom. It's not all. The kingdom is coming. The gospel, the, the course titled The Kingdom, the book is coming. So the ebook is available. Go to www.kingdombooksclub.com among the new releases spiritual gifts, and ministry. Discover, pursue, fulfill. Take them. It's all free because it's part of what the Father has asked us to do in the gospel of the kingdom. Don't merchandise anything. Don't sell anything. There are revelations from Elohim. We are mere vessels through which he's passing it through. So we don't even own the copyright. It's just for formalism. No Babylonian copyright restrictions because the truth when the Lord gives the word, great is the company that publishes it. Will you now be part of that company that will publish the word, that will advance the word, that will promote the word to other parts of the world? Let people know the truth that sets free. So that we can be freed of the yoke of uh, uh, Christian religion, defining seminaries based on the enlightenment, the logicalization of the word, so that we get back to the gospel. As given in the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible is the constitution of the kingdom. It's valid. It's good. It has everything we need. And we don't need humanistic wisdom. Men and brethren, let us pray. Distribute it. May the Father, by His Spirit, Lord, we ask you to bring understanding to your people. Grant your people understanding. Let your people embrace your truth and not run away from your truth. For your truth is liberating. Your truth is defining. Enable your people to understand that what you've called us to do, this is a profoundly different thing. This is taking back the gospel, going back to where it fell out from, to pick it up and to run with it. We look up to you, Lord, by your Spirit, to enable us with all the wisdom and all the grace to communicate your truth. And Father, we pray that no one who hears the truth will be guilty on the last day of turning his back to the truth. Have your way, O Lord. Do you be all honor and glory now and forevermore. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.